Sobering times we're living in, huh? Where we just need to be absolutely dependent on King Jesus. Um, I'm going to have Anne Marie come up here and share a word. I think it's really important that she share this. She, she called me earlier this morning, and, and I prayed about it. And I feel like... Um, I feel like I've been doing this a little bit lately, kind of giving, giving some warnings. And uh, you know, I mentioned a couple weeks ago that I think we need to be very cautious um, as a church on who we link with, who we connect with in this season, because there are plots by the enemy to suck God's people into really difficult situations where we're not representing King Jesus well. And uh, so we need, to, we need to be really careful about those linkages and those partnerships. And, and I feel that Anne-Marie has a very imper- important word, and I have my mic right in the back pocket. Look at that. You're so good. There you go. I just want to preface this with how I got this word this morning. I was on an online conference yesterday and heard an amazing woman of God, and she said, when you spend your time with the Lord... Do you ask him what's on his mind? And do you ask him what he's praying for? Because you know what? He prays for us all the time. So I did that this morning. And this is what he gave me. It's a serious word. We no longer should live the rest of our time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. We cannot live to the lusts of men. Out there, you see agendas and lusts of men in full swing. They are living agendas of doctrines of demons and lying devils. Their ideologies are formed by demons. Their thoughts are formed by demons. Their behavior is deceptive to draw you away from the righteousness and justice of God. God is love and mercy and righteous, just, and holy. God rescued Lot, greatly worn out and distressed by the ways of the ungodly and lawless, for that righteous man tortured his righteous soul every day with what he saw and heard. Do not make mismated alliances with them or come under a different yoke with them, inconsistent with your faith. What harmony can there be between Christ and Satan? We are the temple of the living God. Come out from among them and be separate. God is saying, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that contaminates and defiles our souls. Consecrate ourselves daily to Jesus and walk in the fear of the Lord and the counsel of his word and the Holy Spirit. If the root is holy, so are the branches holy. A good tree cannot produce corrupt fruit, and a corrupt tree cannot produce good fruit. You will know a tree by its fruit. Amen. Thank you, Emery. You know, it's our job as spiritual leaders not just to make you feel good, but to occasionally give warnings and to put caution before you uh, in a pretty dangerous environment. Um, you know, I've been, I try to limit this as much as possible, but I want to be in, in prayerful consideration about what's going on in our city and culture. So you, you want to be abreast of what's happening in the news so you can pray for people. We're called to pray for our, our representatives in our city, our police chiefs, our mayors, our legislators. So, uh, you know, we're not to be ignorant about what's going on, but we can't let that get in us and control us, our emotions, the way we feel, the way, the, the way that we act and, and react. And, you know, we're in, we're in this really weird season, too, where we have, uh, a, it's a presidential campaign, and we have a, a couple, couple leaders who, quite frankly, are acting like children and pointing fingers, you know, at each other and you know, it's just, you know, blaming and blame shifting, and it's just, it's, it's exhausting. I don't know about you, but it just gets on me, and it's just, and it's just tiring. And, um, 
I, go back, I go back to the Word, and I go back to my relationship with, with Jesus. And, and I said, Lord, you know, I don't, I don't have the answers, and I don't think anybody out there does, um, but you do. You have the answer. And you care about us. We're your, we're your children. We're citizens of heaven. And he's, I think he's instructing us through um, the truth of his word, through, through prophets and different, different intercessors. And there's a lot of caution out there about the linkages and partnerships that, that, that the church has with things out, out there in the world. Unwittingly, I think a lot of our young people are getting sucked into groups that, that, are, that are dangerous and that are, they're, they're really supporting doctrines of demons. You know, they have the, the appearance of being these social justice movements, but they're not. They're dangerous movements. And, and I, gave, I gave a warning a few weeks ago about that, and I believe that word is directly, directly speaking to it. But it's not just about that specific group. We're, we have to be wise as serpents, gentle as doves, but wise as serpents. We are, living, we are living in a culture, we're living in a season where we need the wisdom and revelation of God. We need prophetic insight. And unless you have it, don't go out. Don't go out of your house. There's a, there's a promise in Scripture that says, I'll heal your land, but there are some prerequisites to that. And that's that we humble ourselves, which is taking the low road, the low position, not being the one that's most vocal, being wise, holding your tongue, being prayerful, being circumspect. Remember that word that I gave, gave you that the Lord was speaking over the church to be, to be circumspect, to be, to be cautious? Um, we're, living, we're living in that season. And that's a call to his entire church to be, to be cautious. So, Anne-Marie, I appreciate you just sensing that and feeling so strongly and submitting that. And I believe that's a, that's a really important word. Because we're seeing a lot of, a lot of people that are yelling, yelling and, and posturing in the world of, of you know, this, this crazy political and, and social activist environment. And uh, he's, he wants his people to rise to the occasion, but not to do it the way the world does. I think what we're seeing is a failure of mankind to be able to govern himself rightly. And we think the answer is in the democratic process or the right president, but it's not. You know, I, I, believe, that, I believe that leaders, our, our police force, you know, our, our, our presidents, our laws can restrain evil, but ultimately does nothing to fix a man's heart. And there's, there's, this, there's this thing in a, in a man's heart that's corrupt until it's, until it's transformed. And, and unless we're careful, we can give in to the flesh, even as sons and daughters of God. And do things that won't expand the kingdom, but do the opposite, but resi resist the kingdom. The last, uh, the last few weeks and the next, the next few weeks, I don't know how long, but we're going to be talking about the kingdom. Really, you can read anything in the Bible, and it's, it's talking about the kingdom. Um, yeah, I, I, actually, all of our messages really are about, about the kingdom. That was... That was Jesus' priority, his focus was about the kingdom because he knew that the kingdoms of this earth would fail. And if our eyes are not on the kingdom of God, on the kingdom of heaven and his rule and his reign, we will be sorely disappointed. You know, we can't bank on, you know, most, most forms of government have come and they've gone. And there are some people who believe that the Democratic Republic that it could come and it could go. And ultimately it will go because when Jesus comes back, he's going to replace it all because, because it's all imperfect. Because men are imperfect and men are running it. And unless, and unless the church really zeroes in and, and makes Jesus the king of their life in every area of their life, then heaven will not be manifest. We won't bring heaven to earth because that's our call as sons and daughters of God to bring heaven to to earth, but there's, there's only one way to do that, and that's the Jesus way. You know, you remember the bracelets that people wore around that said, what would Jesus do? It's not just about what would Jesus do, it's what would Jesus say? What was it last year? Was the decade of the mouth? Yeah. Was the, is it this year? Oh, it's still not over yet. Friday, it's over? Well, gee, you know, I'm not that far off. <laughs>
What's that? Oh, yeah, 10 years is a decade. I'm, I'm just confused. But this, is, this has been declared the decade, the decade of the mouth because the Lord is really concerned about what the church is saying, what we are vocalizing. And isn't it interesting that it seems like nobody can seem to hold their tongue out there? It's like now we have social media platforms so that we can say something and everybody in the world can see it in a moment. And I think the church, church catches itself embarrassing itself in not representing and in, in, in reflecting the glory of God because what we say and what we do and who we partner with. And the Holy Spirit's warning us in this season. We need to rely on not an earthly king, but King Jesus who's sitting on the throne. You know, the nation of Israel thought that they found a better way to govern themselves. And they thought, well, you know, every other nation around us has a king. Maybe we need a king. You know, before that, um, there were judges that would rule, and he would raise up judges to deal with specific issues, and then those judges would kind of fade into the background because God was king. He wanted a theocracy. God wanted, he wanted to be king. He wanted to rule his people, but that wasn't good enough for man. And, his, and, and man in his wisdom thought, well, we need a king. And look at the first king that Israel got, King Saul. Didn't pan out very well. You know, 1 Samuel 8, 6, and 7, it's recorded where the Israelites were, they were complaining to, uh, to Samuel because they didn't like his two sons who happened to be judges and they weren't following the ways of the Lord. And the Lord told Samuel this because Samuel was concerned about this. He said, listen to all the people and what they're saying to you. They haven't rejected you. So evidently, Samuel was feeling a little bit insecure. He probably realized he blew it by raising up his sons to be judges because it doesn't, it doesn't say in Scripture that, that the Lord told him to do that. But maybe he was just getting tired and he was getting old. Well, I'm going to let my boys do the job. And they didn't do a very good job. And you know, so he's feeling insecure. Maybe he's feeling like he made a mistake. And, and the Lord's telling him, they didn't reject you, Samuel. They've actually rejected me as their king. I think we're living in a time that's prophetically significant of Romans, Romans 8, 19 through 22, where it says, the, For the earnest expectation of creation er, eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons in God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God, for we know the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. I think the whole earth is groaning with birth pangs, waiting for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed. I think what we're experiencing in the world today is a tension between what is now and what will be. The, real, the world is really crying out, for a truly righteous king, a truly righteous individual that will reign on a throne, and there's only one individual that would do that, and that's King Jesus. I lost count as I was going through Scripture of the amount of times that Jesus spoke about the kingdom. He was obsessed with the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. He was obsessed with it. I mean, he started out his ministry, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, half his parables were about the kingdom. Really, all the totality of his sermons were about the kingdom. It was about, it was about his reign in the kingdom of heaven. It's kind of become my latest obsession because I realized as much as I'd like to bank on the Democratic Republic and maybe voting in the right president to fix everything, I don't think it's going to happen. I think the Lord's making that obvious. Now, I think that we can vote, we can vote for somebody that is more righteous, that, that, that supports biblical values, and I think we have a responsibility to do that. It shouldn't be about a personality con a contest. It shouldn't be about color of skin. It should be about who is best rep representing biblical principles. I think it does matter who we vote with. I think we need to individually go before the Lord and ask for, ask for direction. And then sometimes he gives us what we, what we deserve anyhow. And maybe it's not the person that we voted in. 
But just understand that even if the right person gets voted in, the person that you voted in, it's, he's, he or she's not going to fix this mess. Only King Jesus will. And I believe he's going to use his church to do it. You know, if we're going to see peace, if we're going to see shalom peace, if we're going to see order, if we're going to see the lack of violence and drug addiction and all of that, it's the church that has the power because we are the sons and daughters of God. We are citizens of heaven. That's why kingdom is so important. If we don't realize who's king and who's on the throne, then we don't realize the rights that we have to rule and reign with him. In Genesis 1, 26 through 28, we've been reading this a lot lately, but I think it's because the Lord's trying to get a point across to us that the original mandate was a cultural mandate to mankind to rule and to reign with him. It said, you know, God created us in his own image. And he created us to have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the earth and every creeping thing, everything that lived in it and lives in it. He gave us rule and reign for over. But there's something that he didn't give us rule and reign for. And it seems like that, that's what we spend most of our time trying to controlling. What would that, who, or who would that be? You notice it doesn't include mankind? It says we're su- supposed to subdue and take dominion over this earth that he's given mankind, but it never says that we're supposed to control each other. And that's what I, I find that most people are trying to do. That's, what that's certainly what I try to do as a father, to control my children. But it, but it seems like all, everybody out there just wants to control everybody. And that's never been our mandate. We're supposed to submit to the Lord Jesus, and we're supposed to serve one another. Being sons and daughters of God means that we take dominion, we steward all that he's given us, every resource that he's given us, this earth that he's given us, we steward it properly, but that's our job, and that's where our job should end. Now, he does give us direction in other passages of Scripture. In Ephesians 3, 9 through 11, it says, And I will make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. Not to men, but to the principalities and powers in heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, there's something else that we're supposed to not give into, and that's the enemy. That's Satan and his demonic forces. And I see Christians unwittingly giving in to that by not representing and reflecting the glory of God, the love of God, the patience of God, the long-suffering of God. You know, we are, in a sense, partnering with the enemy. And we're supposed to manifold his wisdom. We're supposed to display his manifold wisdom. And, you know, people are not our enemies. We're not supposed to control people, right? There are, there are a lot of people that I would love to control. I would love to, you know take a zipper and put it over certain people's mouths, but that's not, that's not what we are called to do. We're called to pray for them and pray blessing over them and pray, pray that they would have wisdom and revelation. We, we should never be pitted against people. And I think a lot of these protests were pitted against people. A lot of people are screaming for justice, but it's not God's justice. They've already, they, they, they've made the verdict in their mind. That's not justice, and that's not God's justice. Matter of fact, you wouldn't be very comfortable with God's justice because he would let most people off. If people asked for forgiveness, he would just forgive them, and that would be the end of it. We as Christians don't even do a good job with that. But we're called to be sons and daughters of the king, citizens of heaven. We're supposed to display the manifold wisdom of God, and that manifold wisdom means the heart in the mind, in the will, in the desire. You know, I think it's good practice. That bracelet, what would Jesus do and what would Jesus say? I really think it's good practice nowadays. Before you do anything, before you say anything, before you join any group, before you do anything, you should ask, Jesus, what do you want me to do? And I have a feeling that he might put a stop to a lot of your efforts to solve problems. Galatians 4, 4 through 5 says, But when the fullness of time come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. I think that we forget that we're sons and daughters 
of God. If we, are, if we really had a revelation that we were sons and daughters of God, we would be a whole lot less worried about what's happening in the world. Concern? Yes. Grief? Yes. Not worry. Not anger, which produces wrath if we give into it. God wants us to be obsessed with King Jesus because he's on his throne. Nobody's going to usurp him off of his throne. He's, he's not worried that someone else is going to take over. He's sitting on his throne and he wants to reign, and, and this is how he chooses to reign. He chooses to reign through you. So the question is, are you reigning? Are you acting like you're citizens of heaven, or are you acting like you're citizens of this earth? Because I doubt that I'm a whole lot different than you. I could, I could give into my flesh and act like heaven is not my home, and I can act a lot like earth, and I can act a lot like the flesh. And if we're not careful, and King Jesus isn't reigning in our heart, something else will. You know, the problem with all human governments is not the type of government. It's not socialism. It's not communism. It's not a kingdom. It's not being ruled by a king or directed by a president. The problem is human nature. The problem is the heart of men. And I see a lot of people, again, pointing fingers at specific groups or people because of what they say or what they do or the color of, the color of their skin. Like, like, that's, like they're the problem. Like Democrats are the problem or Republicans are the problem. That's not the problem. The problem is that we're involved in the process. The problem is, is that man's heart is corrupt. And unless it, it, it receives a transformation, unless, it, unless we submit to King Jesus, then it's hopeless. And that's what the world is experiencing, hopelessness. And the world is waiting for the sons and God, daughters of God to be revealed. Because I believe that we have, we have the solution because we have King Jesus. And he's going to give us wisdom and he's going to give us revelation. I want to define what his kingdom is. His kingdom is sovereign rulership and governing influence over the earth. Impacting it with his will, his intent, and his purpose. Manifesting a culture and a society reflecting the king's nature, values, and morals. God's original intention was to have a nation of kings and priests. That was his original intention. It hasn't changed. Kings and priests. Not presidents, not dictators, but kings and priests who serve and minister. That's what God desires from us, and that's what God desires from the church. And that won't happen unless we make Jesus king again of our lives. I was going to go through a bunch of characteristics of, of the king that I discovered in a book, but I'm just going to skip that. I think it's important for you to meditate on that. What does it mean to make Jesus king in your life? What does that mean? There is a practical application of that. God wants to manifest his kingdom through you. What does that mean? What does that look like? What does that look like when you're posting things on Facebook? What does that look like in your marriage and in your home and in your family? What does that look like at work? Because wherever we are, because we're citizens of heaven, the kingdom of heaven is there. We think we're powerless, but we're not. Because wherever we are, because that's the nature of the kingdom, if we understood the nature of the kingdom, we would understand that we have the force of heaven behind us wherever we are. God wants us to display what his kingdom is and what it means. So that's what we need. Those are the answers that we need in this season. Not man's solutions, to these problems, but God's solutions to these problems. And we have to be bold about it. If God convicts us to share a word that might make people maybe not like us, or we, you know, I'd rather share the encouraging word. You know, tell people that God just has roses in their future. I mean, that'd be nice. 
You know, but sometimes he needs to give us a warning, and this is, this is a warning. This is, we have an opportunity to rise up and transform a generation of people. Or we can let it pass us by, and we'll get some of the same thing that we've been getting for the last how many years? Let's pray. This, this idea of kingdom, Jesus, you were obsessed with. You were obsessed with it. It's, it's all you talked about in your teachings, in your parables. You are obsessed with kingdom and the idea of kingdom because it's your idea. God, it's your idea. We have these structures down here that only fail us. I don't want to minimize what government does. I don't want to minimize what law enforcement does. We need all of them and we're to pray for them. But Lord, what they need most of all is your wisdom. They need revelation. They need prophetic insight. Because only your wisdom and only your prophetic insight can bring true healing to a man's heart. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of frustration. There's a lot of angst out there. And people are worried and they're full of fear and they're angry. And I think most of it is misguided because the fact is that this, there's a longing in their heart, there's an emptiness that they're feeling that will never be that will never be filled if if the problem that's in their mind is fixed. It's only going to be filled with you, Jesus, when they encounter you and when they meet you. So Jesus, be the king in my heart. Be the king in my life so that your kingdom is reflected through me, that your kingdom principles, your kingdom ways would bring conviction on a culture that is obsessed with self and what they think that they deserve. And we know as believers what we deserve, but we also know what you've given us because of your love and your mercy and your grace for us. So Lord, may your people, may your kingdom people be filled with love and grace and mercy. Those are the things that will transform culture. So Lord, we pray that we would be humble, that we would repent of our sin, and that we would kneel and that we would pray and that you would bring healing to our city and to our land. Lord, I lift up Mayor Lovely. I lift up our police department that seems to be in shambles. I lift up our city that seems to be pulling itself apart, pointing fingers and everybody's angry with everybody. And there doesn't seem to be a solution that's evident. I pray, Lord, that you would give them divine revelation that you would transform their heart and you would transform their mind, that you would send them a prophet or you would send them a prophetess that they would listen to. And that this, that this city would, would again represent something that transformed the city in the days of Finney. That you would bring not just revival, but that you would bring a revolution in this city that displayed love and forgiveness and therefore peace would reign. We just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.